Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Yo, Marine! At a party, a young Marine finds himself surrounded by gang members with no way out. In Texas, two women and a young boy have a dangerous encounter with a UFO. Meet Josephine White. She's a master con artist who has taken her victims for more than one million dollars. And a rising young basketball star searches for the anonymous hero who saved him from drowning. These are stories that are guaranteed to surprise you. I'm Dennis Farina, and for the next hour, it's Unsolved Mysteries. Shots from members of a gang. A man is left for dead, but not a rival gang member, an innocent victim. He is 20 year old Joffrey Ramos, handsome, good natured, and a dedicated Marine. Joffrey and some other Marines had been invited to a party. That was supposed to be innocent fun. Come on, guys. Plenty more of that. Come on. Hey, guys. You made it. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Uh, what did you bring? This is Joffrey. The clean-cut Marines mingled easily with the crowd of party goers. According to one of Joffrey's friends, this included some gang members. They didn't say nothing to us, you know. They didn't pay no mind to us, you know. They didn't start no trouble with us. We just, we did our thing and they did theirs, you know. And then, without warning. What do you think you were doing with Pablo? Then that's when the whole fight broke out. Just everybody was fighting. Joffrey and his friends decided not to get involved. It was time to go. When they reached the Jeep, Joffrey remembered that he had left his wallet in the backyard. His friend did not see him turn back, and they drove off without him. Joffrey didn't know that he was heading straight for a fight. Some gangs considered destroying a Marine a badge of honor. Yo, Marine! What's up, man? Let's get him, man. Come Nothing. On, man. Come on. Let's take, take this down. fool out, Holmes. <laughs> the ringleader of the group was a known gang member named Louis Quesada. What's up, you know how to kill Marines? Yeah. We can show you. You're going down, man. Joffrey sized up the odds. There was only one way out. Hey, let's get him. Get him, get him, get him, get him. Hurry up, get him. Joffrey never had a chance. He was beaten and kicked over and over again. The vicious attack lasted a full five minutes. It was long enough for Joffrey's friends to return. They went inside to look for him. Meanwhile, a car happened to drive up the street. Quesada assumed that it was filled with Marines and took aim. By the grace of God, there was nobody hit. And we very much could have had five additional people laying out there dead. I believe a neighbor. Well, somebody was yelling, there's a dead kid in the street. So then we ran over there. Grab some ready. Pull him over, ready? One, three, go. And you could say it was like a nightmare. Ramos. Ramos. I don't know, man. the way he looked, Ramos. bloody, his face was swollen. He was breathing, but he looked like he was just dead, you know? This guy needs help, man. He's bleeding. In all that commotion, the police arrested the Marines. Doing? We're Marines, man. We didn't our initial belief because of the injuries that Joffrey incurred in the beating was that he was going to die. 
and even though he hadn't died yet, we were handling it as if he had died, because it was that serious. It was awful just to see him laying there like that. I remember looking through these glass walls that they had in the room, and I could see him laying there. His head was bandaged, and it had tubes coming out of his head. And his face, oh, his whole face was swollen, his nose, his lip. And uh, I thought I was going to die. One side of Joffrey's head had been crushed. He underwent emergency brain surgery and spent three weeks in a coma. Doctors did not think he would survive. I was unconscious for a long time, huh? And um, when I came up, I, I didn't know anything. Yeah, there's some, um, now some things are coming, but some are still gone. Joffrey suffered some permanent brain damage. It's remarkable that he's even alive, much less functioning. He spent eight months learning to walk and talk again. It's very unfair that Joffrey has to go through life facing all of these challenges that he has now, while Louis Quesada is out there having a good time and doesn't even have any idea of what he's done to Joffrey or any, you know, or any of us. Joffrey had hoped to make the military a career. Instead, he had to accept an honorable discharge from the Marines. I'll think about this till I get old, and the number one question is why? Why would they, why would they do that? Update. Louis Quesada has been captured. Los Angeles police received the tip that Quesada had fled to Mexico. He was arrested and brought to the United States to stand trial. Quesada was convicted of attempted murder and sentenced to 21 years in prison. Next, three people in Texas develop a mysterious illness within hours of their encounter with a UFO. State Road 1485 near Dayton, Texas, on the outskirts of Houston. That sure was a good dinner. At around 9 p.m., Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's seven-year-old grandson, Colby, were returning home after dinner. Mama, what's that light? What is that light? We were just driving along talking, and all of a sudden, we seen this bright light. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that there was something that was lighting up the sky. It seems to be moving closer. You're right, Vicki, it is. You could see it through the trees, and it started to get real close. Then I knew it wasn't a, a plane. We had begun to feel the heat, and all of a sudden, Vicky screamed for me to stop. Daddy, stop, stop! And when I stopped, she went forward, and her handprint was embedded into the dash of the car. And I thought, well, I've got to see what this is. So I walked toward the front of the automobile, and I stood there looking up to try to figure out what this object was. It was a diamond-shaped object. Then at the bottom, flames were shooting out. The heat was tremendous. It just felt like I was burning from the inside out. I was actually afraid, really, to move. Betty, let's get out of here! When I reached for the door handle, the door handle was so hot I couldn't even begin to hold on to it. I was more than scared. The only thing I was thinking was, are we going to get out of here alive? It's moving away. Just moments later, a large squadron of helicopters descended on the area. They were the large 
helicopters that has the double rotaries on them. I counted 22, and uh, I knew it had to belong to the Army. For years, Betty, Vicki, and Colby have battled with the government, trying to get clear answers to what actually took place that night. They've also fought against mysterious illnesses, illnesses whose symptoms appeared just hours after the encounter. Emma! Colby? At one o'clock, Colby woke me up crying, and he was begging me for water. He had a fever, and he had vomited all over the bed. Does your tummy hurt? The next morning, Vicki and Colby were still suffering from nausea and what appeared to be severe cases of sunburn. Betty? Betty was in even worse shape. You awake? Her temperature was dangerously high, and large red welts had appeared on her face and hands. Hi, Betty. Over the next four days, Betty's condition grew more serious. Vicki finally convinced her to see a doctor in Houston. Betty was immediately admitted to the hospital. She has been on the sun a much, maybe? No. Three weeks later, she underwent treatment for acute radiation poisoning. What I'd like to do is admit her to the hospital and run some more tests. Betty was in the hospital for six weeks. She lost more than 50% of her hair and patches of skin on her face. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Betty was exposed to high doses of radiation. As to what the source was, I can't exactly say. After her release from the hospital, Betty asked for help from UFO investigator John Schuschler, a former NASA project manager. We had done several interviews with Betty and Vicki, and then we went out to the location where this happened. They were very, very clear on where it happened and how it happened. Yes, sir. Came right over those trees right there, sir. They were able to tell us exactly where along the road that they stopped because there were certain markers that identified the spot. They were able to point out exactly what they saw, the object coming down out of the sky over the road and hovering there. They were able to point out a spot on the road that indicated that uh, it had been heated to an extreme level of heating. It was burned, and it was very clear to the naked eye. Several weeks after we went to the spot and saw this burned area, someone came along, dug up the road, and hauled it away and replaced it with new asphalt. Uh, some of the witnesses that watched this happen said that people brought in unmarked trucks, dug up the road, put the material on the trucks, covered it with a tarpaulin, and drove away. What did it do when it hovered over the trees? In addition to taking Betty and Vicki's testimony, we went to every individual living within five miles of this area. At least 10 other people had seen the object, and seven or eight other people had seen the helicopters. And their descriptions were all very similar to, the, to what Betty and Vicki described. One eyewitness was police officer L. L. Walker, who was in the area on the night that Betty and Vicki encountered the object. My wife, Marie, and I was returning back from my mother and dad's. And uh, as we was coming out of some tree lines, uh, I saw a helicopter. It was shining a spotlight at the ground. And then I heard other noise of other helicopters behind it. And I stopped the car because I didn't know what was going on. The helicopters were military. And they was all flying fairly low to the ground. And all of them had search beams on. I thought maybe there was an airplane down, but uh, they didn't hesitate. They just kept on in the same direction they was going, which would probably intersect the area where Vicki said that her encounter was. Convinced that the military was somehow involved, Betty and Vicki appealed to their senators. The Air Force agreed to a meeting at Bergstrom Air Force Base. As they entered the room, Vicki noticed a large map. The exact spot where the encounter occurred was clearly marked. Well, sir, we were coming home from dinner, and as we were going down this road, we saw this large object. According to Betty and Vicki, they were questioned for more than two hours. The interview was recorded by a military stenographer. Then what happened? Well, as I got in the car, then the helicopters started approaching. What helicopters? The military helicopters. 
You say military. Yes, sir. How do you know they were military? In the end, the two men denied that any military or government operation had been conducted at that time and at that place. The women were told that they were entitled to file a claim and that the Air Force would review their case. Get them to your lawyers and get them back to us. Four weeks later, Betty and Vicky's claims for medical damages were denied. Come on, Colby. What did Betty Cash and Vicky and Colby Landrum see in the Texas sky on that winter night? There are two possible explanations in this case. One is it was an experimental craft of some kind by probably our government. The other, it was a, a, an unidentified flying object, possibly extraterrestrial. I don't believe in the little green men. And uh, it had to be an object. It could have been a spacecraft that the government was carrying, but our government was carrying it. Betty, Vicki, and Kobe continue to battle illnesses that doctors say could be the result of massive radiation exposure. Betty has been diagnosed with several types of cancer. She, Vicki, and Kobe all have white blood cell counts that are far below normal. Their immune systems now have difficulty fighting off even minor infections. Vicky's having visual problems, and there are lots of suggestions that that may be related to radiation as well, but depends on the kind of exposure, and someone needs to tell us what the exposure was so we can figure it out. If it's a top secret object that's protecting the United States, then I could say I could, I could forgive them for that. But at least they owe us to tell us exactly why we were burned and what type of radiation that we were exposed to and how much. Update. After the UFO incident, Betty Cash was hospitalized for cancer treatments at least once every year. She died 18 years later at the age of 69. The Air Force declined to be interviewed for this story. Their official position is that no military or government operation had taken place. If you have any information about the incident at Dayton, Texas, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a young woman is murdered, and three eyewitnesses come forward, each with a different story. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The unclothed body of a young woman is found by children playing in a vacant lot. Three massive blows to the head have crushed her skull. Every parent hears of these stories that it's your worst nightmare. It's worse than that. The person that hurt Amy and took Amy has no idea what they've done. I mean, uh, she was such an integral, vital part of life. It's very hard, very, very hard. I guess the biggest question in anybody's mind is why did the person choose Amy? The victim was Amy Willard, home from school for the summer. At school, she was a star athlete. Amy had been ranked among the top 25 female lacrosse players in the United States. Amy always said whether they won or lost, she had a good day, she felt good. It didn't matter what the outcome was. They didn't have to win all the time as long as everybody enjoyed what they were doing as much as she did. Amy had no enemies, no secret habits or taste for danger. There was no apparent reason for her to die. The police focused on Amy's movements the night that she was killed. They eventually heard from three different men claiming to have been at the scene of the crime. Each one had a different story to tell, and each one would become a suspect. On the night she was killed, Amy met friends at Smokey Joe's Tavern, a well-known college hangout. 
She stayed for about three hours. Are you seeing anyone? Yeah, I've gone on a couple of dates lately. Her friends say that she drank less than one beer and left the bar somewhere between 1.30 and 1.40 a.m. At 2.03 a.m., Amy's car was discovered by off-duty paramedics. It was pulled over on the shoulder of a highway transition road, engine running, headlights on, and the car radio was playing. Amy, however, was gone. And there were fresh blood stains on the pavement. Within an hour, state police were scouring the area for clues. They found some blood along the right side of the car on the guardrail. They found a palm print on the car. And the next morning, about 10 AM, at the top of the ramp, they found uh, her underwear and her tennis shoes. With daylight, the search expanded to include helicopters, canine teams, and hundreds of volunteers. Around noon, a guy showed up at the ramp and told him he had been on the ramp the night before and had seen a car. Did you see anyone near the car? No, I just saw the car. They took his name and address and said they'd get back in touch with him. And in the interim, they checked him out and found out that he used to work in the area of 16th and Indiana where Amy's body was found. Amy's body was dumped 20 miles from her car and just five blocks from where the young man had once worked. The investigation quickly focused on this self-proclaimed eyewitness. At first, he seemed cooperative. Police searched his car and they found handcuffs. They found a flashlight that is the type used by police. And when they searched his house, they found some police paraphernalia. And they also found a magazine that you could be used to order police equipment. Before the search, investigators learned that the man had once been charged with impersonating a police officer. And then without warning, he suddenly stopped cooperating and hired a lawyer. He says through his lawyer, he didn't do it. But he also denies coming to the ramp that day, and police are steadfast, saying he did come to the ramp. No, just the eyewitness remained the potential suspect, but police were unable to find any evidence to link him directly to the murder. Meanwhile, a second witness came forward to say that he, too, drove by Amy's car the night she was killed. The second witness, an off-duty Pennsylvania state trooper, claimed that he saw Amy's car and spoke to a uniformed policeman sitting in a squad car that was parked behind it. The trooper would later resign. The police are very adamant that this trooper was elsewhere when he said he was on the ramp, but the trooper is just as adamant that he saw what he saw. And he has always stood by his story that he saw this cop car behind Amy's. And then a third witness came forward. It was a local policeman. He claimed to have driven by Amy's car. Are you okay here? Yeah, you already called the local PD. They're on their way. He also reported that he had talked to the ambulance crew. The police re-interviewed the ambulance crew, and they said that absolutely they had not talked to this officer that night. He agreed to resign from the force and cooperate fully with them, and in exchange, he would not be prosecuted for lying to them. One alleged police impersonator and two officers each had thrust himself into the limelight with an eyewitness account, and each, in turn, was viewed as a potential suspect. There are a lot of coincidences here. Um, the first suspect worked in the area of where Amy's body was found. The trooper lived around the corner, very near where Amy lived with her mom. The officer used to take his drunk drivers for blood tests to the hospital where Amy's mom works. Are they coincidences, or are they all linked? I mean, that's for the police to find out. A woman like Amy would not have stopped for just anyone. It's nearly 2 AM in the morning. She's in a car. She's alone. So a police impersonator or a police officer seems to be the most likely reason she would have pulled over. Take a step out of the car, please. I 
I think Amy realized she was in trouble and was gonna run and took off and that she was moving. They hit her and Amy was gone. That's what I would like to think happened, that she only had fear for a couple seconds and that she didn't know anything else that happened to her. We loved Amy, we loved her more than anything in this world. And we are thankful to God for giving her to us. And the way that he chose to end her life, that's something that we try to deal with, but we're not going to dwell on. Our job is making sure that Amy is remembered for the wonderful person that she was instead of the way that her life was ended. That's for the police to handle. Update. Amy Willard's murder has been solved and none of the three original suspects were involved. Almost a year after Amy died, a woman reported that her car was intentionally bumped by a driver who tried to get her to pull over. She gave the man's license plate to the police. The car was traced to Arthur Jerome Bomer Jr., who was on parole after killing a man over a parking spot. DNA tests showed a match between Bomar and a sample found on Amy's body. I ain't done nothing. Arthur Jerome Bomar Jr. was convicted of rape, murder, and kidnapping. He was sentenced to death by a lethal injection. Next, the police track a female con artist, a criminal with a thousand faces. Norwood, Massachusetts. An elderly woman who we'll call Barbara is approached by an excited and nervous stranger. Right by that newspaper, I found this bag. But let me show you what I found. I found this. I think there's about $70,000 in there. What, what do you think we should do? I says, you better go to police to find out. Oh, she says, no, I don't go to police. Maybe they take money and uh, I don't want that. Inside, I found this note. And look, look, this is all it says. It says, dear brother, we've done it again. This time at the racetrack, I've enclosed the money and sent it this way to avoid paying income tax. And then it signed Jose. Excuse me, ladies, but is, is that something wrong? May I be of any help to you? Barbara is retired and living on a small pension. She is about to fall victim to a well-rehearsed scam known as the pigeon drop. The wad of money she has been shown is worthless. The woman is a con artist, and the man is her accomplice. It is a good idea. Come on, it's a great idea. So why not? go. Barbara is the perfect target for con artist Josephine White, a master of the pigeon drop. White has allegedly scanned nearly a million dollars from her innocent victims, all of them living on small, fixed incomes. Once I pinned down that the person I was looking for was Josephine White, I was surprised to see how many different appearances that she had. She changes like a chameleon. She puts on weight, she loses weight. She was described in a number of different fashions. And in addition to her own appearance changing, she'll use wigs, sunglasses, quite a bit of jewelry, and very often this will grab a woman's attention away from the actual physical appearance. You know, my, my boss is like, he's like a tax specialist. I mean, he's a wizard with finances. Why don't we just go talk to him? I mean, he'll... White and her accomplice are about to begin phase two of the pigeon drop. They persuade Barbara to go with them to get advice from Josephine's boss. And my wife, oh, God, What's God bless her soul. Well, well, she's got a cancer in the stomach or something. To lure Barbara and, and further into, into their trap, the accomplice tells a hard luck story, emphasizing how desperately he needs the money. They arrive at an office building where Josephine claims her boss works. Don't worry. Are you sure? Yes. I don't know. Uh, maybe we should tell police. Ma'am, don't worry about it, please. The older woman actually wants to do the right thing. Even though the victim may make mention of backing out of the situation, the third party puts the pressure on them. So she has emotion playing on one side and pressure of the money being given to her on the other side. She's really caught in a vice. 
White tells them that her boss says that they can legally keep the money, $22,000 each. But she claims that a $5,000 good faith deposit for income tax purposes is required. Do you have a credit card on you? Phase three of the scam now begins. Convince Barbara to put up the $5,000. Oh no, I don't use credit card. Well, do you have $5,000 in the bank? Oh, maybe, maybe I have $5,000. Let's get going, let's go. Right. Remember, by the end of the day, you'll have the $5,000 back in the bank, plus $22,000 more. And you're sure you want to take it all? One, two... $5,000 is four, nearly all of five, Barbara's savings. Six, seven, White returns to the same office building. I'll go give him this. She tells Barbara that she'll show the $5,000 to her boss. A few minutes later, White returns and triggers the final phase of the pigeon drop. You can go in and get your money now, room 204. Barbara is instructed to meet the boss herself. We'll be right here waiting for you. There was nobody there. Then I come back again to the place where they was parked. Barbara finds the parking lot empty. Josephine White, the car, the man, and Barbara's $5,000 have vanished. The scam has taken less than two hours. At this point, the victim is devastated. The victim doesn't know what to do. Their trust has been betrayed. They mull it over in their mind. Geez, if I tell my family, they're gonna think I'm a stupid old woman. If I tell my son, he may put me in a nursing home. And all these terrible thoughts go through their mind in conjunction with the embarrassment and the problems of losing large sums of money. Josephine White is said to have victimized more than 100 elderly men and women just like Barbara. Update. Josephine White was arrested as she was running one of her scams. She pleaded guilty to three larceny charges and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Coming up, a young man's second chance at life and his search for the mystery woman who saved him. We recently told you about a con man named Edward Chase Maynard. He preyed on middle-aged women, stealing their hearts and then their money. One of Maynard's alleged victims was a woman from Michigan. She claims that he romanced her and then he made off with her money, more than $100,000. He's got to be stopped. He cannot manipulate other women like he did me. Authorities were certain that Maynard was somewhere in the U.S. stalking his next victim. Update. The night of our broadcast, viewers called to report that Maynard had recently been in Naples, Florida, using the alias Eric Kelly. He had been romantically involved with a woman we'll call Anne, and had persuaded her to lend him $15,000. He then disappeared with the money. A few months later, Maynard showed up in San Antonio, Texas, using the same alias. He began whining and dining, yet another woman. He kept talking about how that he could really do a lot for me, but of course it would take a lot of money. And uh, he started asking me if I had money, how much I had. And so I started feeling very strongly that something was wrong. I've asked you for a simple favor, a loan of $300 until tomorrow morning. Mike. He said, I need you to loan me some money. And I indicated that I didn't want to. And at that point, he got very loud, a violent temper. But I need $300. <gasps> and I need it now. Do you understand? And to be very honest, he frightened me. So 
I gave him the money, and I did not see him again after that evening. Barbara notified the local sheriff's department about her run-in with Eric Kelly. Wednesday evening, I got a phone call from someone in the sheriff's department. He had said, hey, are you watching Unsolved Mysteries on TV? Our boy was just on there. I said, Eric Kelly? He said, yes, bigger than life. I'm getting ready to call the FBI and give them all the information that I have. Four days later, another viewer tip placed Maynard in Houston, Texas. He was registered in this motel using the same alias. The FBI closed in. We immediately dispatched a number of agents out there. In fact, there was up to eight agents that were on the scene, and within 45 minutes, he was apprehended. While waiting to be brought back to Wisconsin to face charges, Maynard was released on bail and promptly fled. When we aired the story again three years later, Maynard was recaptured, this time in Toledo, Ohio. He was eventually convicted of theft and was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. Philip Macri was a high school basketball star whose life was turned upside down in a split second. It all happened during an ordinary trip to the beach. Virginia Beach, Virginia. We went to the beach the day before the softball tournament, tried to get a nice tan and took out the babes on the beach. And I dove into the water with my hands out forward, breaking the wave. That was the last movement I had, because when I dove into the wave, I uh, broke my neck instantly and couldn't feel anything. I opened up my eyes on the water, and it was real dark and black. And all I heard was the ocean going, shh, shh. I didn't, I didn't know why I wasn't moving. You know, in my mind, I felt like I was moving my arms and swimming, but I wasn't getting nowhere. And I just kept remembering that. I was gonna go way out into the ocean. I was gonna be eaten by sharks. My life was gonna be over. My basketball career was gonna be over because that's all I love to do is play basketball. The previous season, Philip Macri had led his high school team into the state playoffs. He seemed destined to win a college basketball scholarship. And Philip's most glorious moment came during a matchup with his team's arch rival. With the score tied and only seconds remaining, Philip stole the ball. Five seconds. Philip with three. Dribbles to the hoop. Good! But eight months after that victory, Philip wasn't even able to move his arms or legs. He was buffeted by waves, not knowing whether he would live or die. I do remember when I was underwater, I was saying, help, somebody help me. Help, I was screaming. From out of nowhere, Philip got the help he needed. I saw some lady pulling Philip out of the water, but I, the only reason I knew it was him was from his swimming trunks that he had been wearing. And when I saw the swimming trunks, I just ran. What happened here? Phil, Phil, step back. Can you hook up your toes? No. Move something. I heard my sister saying, Philip, Philip, move something. Move your arms, move your legs. And I was gasping for air, and I responded by saying, And that was it. What's wrong with him? With everyone's attention on Philip, the quiet rescuer was all but forgotten. She slipped away before anyone could ask her name. I've often thought about the woman that saved Philip. Now I regret that I didn't thank her at that time. But my mind and my, my thoughts were just all for Philip. Years have passed since the mysterious stranger gave Philip a second shot at life. His injuries have forced him to redefine his goals, but he pursues them with the same determination that he once brought to the basketball court. 
when I was in the hospital in Virginia, I had like three or four goals. First goal was to uh, get off the respirator. My second goal was to get in a wheelchair and don't be so depressed knowing that, you know, it's all right to be in a wheelchair. And my last goal was to go to college and get a degree and get a job. This is Bill McCree coming from the campus of Westminster College. And here are today's sports headlines. Chicago Bears up Cancun. Philip was able to return to the sport that he loves, this time as a play-by-play -play announcer. He has made the most of his gift of life, but still has one very important goal. He would like to personally thank the woman who saved him. It's very important to find this lady who pulled me out of the water because I wouldn't be able to fulfill my goals of being a sports broadcaster. I wouldn't be able to be here with my family today. I wouldn't be able to do the things that I always wanted to do in life if she wouldn't have saved my life. Update. On the night of our broadcast, 43-year-old Linda Potts called us to say that she was Philip's rescuer. Linda lives in Ohio, just 60 miles from Philip's home in Pennsylvania. She had been vacationing in Virginia Beach on the weekend of the accident. Philip was overjoyed to learn that he would finally get his chance to say thank you. Hi, Philip. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it's just gave me tingling all through my body and made me feel real good to know that I could thank her for saving my life. I felt like I found a, a member of my family, uh, a lost member of my family that I hadn't seen in five years. Philip Macri and Linda Potts, two strangers, joined by a twist of fate.